All right, so today we're going to talk about some basic lab equipment and lab safety. So this PowerPoint will also be posted uh, on Google Classroom. The majority of the uses for the equipment we'll discuss are pretty common sense. However, some of the names might be new to you. So you need to familiarize yourselves uh, with the names of the pieces of equipment, and be able to recognize them, and we'll take a little quiz on this next week. And hopefully we'll use uh, this equipment many times throughout the year. So the first and most common piece of lab equipment that we'll talk about and use is a beaker. I think you've all probably seen a beaker before. So beakers are kind of our go-to tool for holding things, whether it's a liquid or a solid. One thing that's important to note is that we don't really use beakers to measure anything. The only time we would ever use a beaker to measure an amount is if we needed around 100 milliliters or around 150 milliliters. Beakers are not accurate when they measure, so any accurate, excuse me, any measurement that we take with a beaker is going to be very approximate. And so we can heat things using a beaker, but we don't want to heat things that might splatter or release a gas. If we have things that might splatter or release a gas when they're heated or stirred, we use what's known as an Erlenmeyer flask. So an Erlenmeyer flask has a lot of the same uses as a beaker. It just has a very narrow neck at the top that prevents things from splattering out when they're heated or stirred. One thing to note about an Erlenmeyer flask is it's very difficult, as you could probably guess, to get a solid out of this flask because the neck is so skinny it's hard to scrape solids out of the bottom. And typically Erlenmeyer flasks do have volumetric labels on them, but just like with the beaker, we don't want to measure things in them unless we're only looking for an approximate measurement. And beakers and Erlenmeyer flasks come in a wide variety of sizes, from a couple of milliliters, the very small ones, to several liters, the very large ones. So the next piece of glassware we have is a volumetric flask. So both of these volumetric flasks are shown with different types of caps. So volumetric flasks, uh, as you might guess, are used to measure out a very certain or very specific volume. Okay, So they are very, very accurate but each volumetric flask can only measure one volume. So the one on the right only measures 250 milliliters. That's what's written on there. And you see the etched line in the neck of the flask corresponds to that measurement. The one on the left, the green one, measures 1,000 milliliters. And you can't see the line here, but somewhere on the neck there is a line, and that corresponds to 1,000 milliliters. There is no way to measure any volume other than 1,000 milliliters or 250 milliliters here. And these come in a wide variety of sizes, but they're typically the numbers you would expect, 1,000, 500, 250, 100 milliliters. Okay, so if you're wanting to measure like 27.5 milliliters, for example, you'll need something like a graduated cylinder. So a graduated cylinder is used to measure volumes of liquid. However, they can measure a wide variety of volumes as compared to a volumetric flask. So graduated cylinders come in a lot of shapes and sizes. You can have very small ones that can only measure a few milliliters or ones that measure hundreds of milliliters. But you'll notice there are markings all up and down the graduated cylinders, so you can measure a wide variety of volumes. And a lot of times you'll see these little plastic rings on the glass graduated cylinders. That way if you knock one over, the glass doesn't hit the table and shatter. And typically there's a little lip at the top of the graduated cylinder, so you can easily pour liquids from them. And so one thing that's important for us to talk about is how we read the graduated cylinders and volumetric flasks. So when we do these in lab or in class and you look at them, you'll notice the water doesn't form a straight line inside the cylinder, whether it be the neck of a volumetric flask or a graduated cylinder. It's a little bit curved, and we call that the meniscus. And we'll talk about the properties of water later in the year and why we see this curve, but for now, just be aware of the name and how to read it. So anytime you have the meniscus on a liquid, whether it be water or any other solution, we want to read the very bottom of it. Okay, So we don't read up here at the top. You read from the very bottom of that curve or that meniscus. And it's also important when you read this that you're at eye level. If you're not at eye level, something we call parallax error occurs. So if you're below eye level or if you're above eye level, you won't get an accurate measurement. So you always want to be sure whether you have a graduated cylinder or a burette or a volumetric flask that you're at eye level with the meniscus. So that might mean you have to squat down or it means you might actually have to move the piece of equipment to a lower surface so you can get an accurate measurement on that. 
<laughs> so a word I said earlier, uh, a burette. We'll talk about that now. So burettes are these two pictures right here, these long glass tubes that have a stopper at the end. Okay, we call this a stopcock. So it's a stopper that can be turned to slowly release a liquid. So imagine filling this long glass cylinder full of a liquid, having the stopcock closed. You can read based on the markings how much liquid is in the cylinder, and then you can slowly release the liquid, whether it be drop by drop or a slow stream. Then you can read the volume again and determine how much liquid was released from the burette. So that's the primary use of a burette. You'll add just kind of a random amount. The amount isn't really necessary to the burette. Read the initial amount, then you can add or release a very specific amount from the bottom of the burette and determine how much of the solution was released. So this stand that we have that holds the burette, if it has a ring on it, we call it a ring stand. Now that's pretty self-explanatory there. One thing to notice about a burette, like I said, when you're reading a burette, we're concerned about how much liquid is released from the cylinder. So the markings on the burette, the top starts with zero. And the further down you go, the numbers get higher. So if you look at the graduated cylinder, the opposite is true. Zero is down here. The higher you go, the larger the numbers get. That's because we're concerned with how much liquid we add to the cylinder. Burettes, we're concerned with how much we release from the cylinder. So the numbers are backwards. So whenever you're reading this, you need to be very careful about that. You see the meniscus is between 25 and 24. So that means the measurement's 24 point something. Okay, so don't just see the 25 at the bottom and assume that it's 25 point something. 25 point whatever it might be would actually be down here somewhere. So anytime you see a picture like this, be sure and note is a burette that's numbered backwards or a graduated cylinder that's numbered in the way you might expect. Next piece of equipment looks similar to a burette, but it's a udiometer tube. And what this is used for is to collect a gas that's produced from a reaction. So one end would be sealed off, one end would be open, and the gas that we produce in a reaction would be collected in this tube. And there are markings on the tube to note how much gas was collected. So if you think about how we might use this, the tube would have to be filled with a liquid water, for example, and then the gas that was produced would displace the water and we could read how much gas was produced in the reaction. So if the year goes, um, hopefully as we have planned, we'll use this a couple of times in the lab. And the next piece of equipment is an evaporating dish. It's a little white ceramic piece of, I guess ceramic, is used to, as you could probably guess, evaporate things. So we have a solution we place in the evaporating dish we put the evaporating dish on top of a Bunsen burner. Which, let's see if I have a picture of a Bunsen burner. So you put the evaporating dish on top of a Bunsen burner. It heats up, the liquid evaporates, and you're left with a solid. <laughs> so then a piece of equipment that is very similar to the evaporating dish is the crucible. And crucible is also typically ceramic. It has the same purpose. It's used to heat something. The main difference is typically we heat solids inside a crucible. We typically heat liquids in evaporating dish, and crucibles tend to have a little lid that come with them. Okay, so the next piece of equipment is a watch glass. It is just a small piece of glass. It has a slight curve to it. Um, it has a lot of uses. We can typically, what we do is we place a small amount of solid on this, and we can use it to take a closer look at it. It can be used to store products. It has a lot of varied uses in the lab, but no major uh, specific use that will uh, that belongs solely to the watch glass. Typically anything we use this for, we could have used something else for as well. Thermometers, I'm not going to insult your intelligence by telling you what a thermometer does. One thing to be sure when we do use thermometers, if we want to measure the temperature of a liquid, make sure the tip of the thermometer is in the liquid. Okay? The temperature of the glass at the bottom of the liquid could be very different from the temperature of the liquid, especially if there's some kind of heating element underneath the glass. So just be aware of that. And the next piece of equipment we'll use quite a bit is a hot plate or a magnetic stir plate. So if you notice on this piece of equipment right here, there's two knobs, one that says heat. So as you can imagine, if you turn the knob that says heat, it's going to get hot. The other is stir. So the way the stir plate works, excuse me, the way the stir plate works is you have these little magnetic bars. So they look kind of like a pill, but they are just magnets. So you take the magnet and you place it inside a solution. 
Okay, you put it on the stir plate. When you turn the stir plate on, the magnet in the stir plate causes the magnet in the solution to spin. And you get a nice little vortex. So you can stir a solution without having to do it manually. We use this quite a few times throughout the year. And they do come separate. You can't have a hot plate that doesn't stir or a stir plate that doesn't get hot, but typically they are combined in one piece of equipment. You know what test tubes look like. We use those for various reactions throughout the year. A test tube holder, and you can probably guess what a test tube holder is used for, as well as a test tube brush, pretty self-explanatory there. Test tube racks, I'm guessing you can figure that one out on your own as well. Rubber stoppers, typically we use those to stop up a test tube. One important thing to note, anytime you stopper a test tube, you should never heat that test tube. Because okay? if you do, you can probably guess what happens there. You'll blow the stopper out and it'll shoot across the lab and I will not be very happy. So well plates we use quite a bit throughout the year. It's just a large piece of plastic that has a bunch of small indentions in it. The small indentions can be used to do Okay, so sorry about that. Uh, the computer tech guy came in to help me out. So I'm gonna start this whole little slide over. Well plates are pieces of plastic that have little indentions in it. We call those the wells. And we can do reactions in these wells. So instead of using a beaker to do a reaction where we, we excuse me, where we require a large amount of chemicals, we can use well plates and use very small amounts of chemicals to do reactions. So if that was a repeat of what I said earlier, I apologize for that. So a glass stir rod is just a long, thin piece of glass. We use it to stir. It is the manual uh, alternative to the magnetic stir bar. Litmus paper, don't worry about this for now. It's on the slideshow. You can omit this slide. We'll discuss that in the spring when we talk about acids and bases. Forceps, uh, otherwise known as tweezers, you can probably guess are removed, or excuse me, are used to remove solids from liquids. So if you have a chunk of solid, we can get it out with forceps if we don't want to stick our fingers down the solution. Funnels, I think you're all intelligent enough to know what a funnel is used for at this point in your life. Typically, we will use a funnel in conjunction with a piece of filter paper, though. So a filter paper can separate a solid from a liquid. Uh, we have the fancy chemistry filter papers that you have to fold into the little triangles that we'll use quite a bit throughout the year. We'll also use coffee filters quite a bit. Coffee filters are the same basic concept as filter papers but they're a lot cheaper they're a lot easier to get hold of so we use those quite a bit they serve the purpose pretty well wash bottles you'll see these in the lab uh, this is just a little squirt bottle we only fill them with water in this lab so they're used just kind of rinse things out or if you need to add a little bit of water to something this will always have distilled water in it if you take higher level classes you'll see these bottles filled with different kinds of types of solvents but for this class they'll always be labeled water spatulas uh, we use to scoop out solids, to stir uh, anything you might can imagine. You use a long, thin piece of metal for typically to remove solid chemicals from their containers, though, if we want to weigh them. If we need to remove a larger amount of the chemical, we use what we call a scoopula. Uh, I typically call it a scoop. It's just a larger version of the spatula. It's a long, curved piece of metal. We have a weigh boat. So a weigh boat is just a nice little piece of plastic. It's a little boat shape. And we can put chemicals in this to weigh. So typically what we'll do is we'll put a weigh boat on top of the balance or on top of the scale, mash the zero button so it subtracts out the mass of the weigh boat, and then put the chemical inside the weigh boat to weigh it out. That way we don't place any chemicals directly on the scales and risk damaging them. So these are disposable. They're plastic. Sometimes in the lab we'll reuse them. It's okay to reuse them if you weigh out the same chemical over and over. That's perfectly okay. An alternative to a weigh boat is weigh paper. It serves the same basic uh, purpose. It protects the balances. The main difference in weigh boat and weigh paper is weigh paper is just a small piece of wax paper that we typically don't want to transport substances in. Weigh boats are far more sturdy, so if we're walking across the lab, we'll use a weigh boat. But if we have a chunk of copper, for example, and we want to weigh it on a balance, we can use weigh paper just to protect the balance. So then we have really three types of balances. The first type of balance is kind of the outdated triple beam balance that you have to do manually. We won't ever use that. Then we have a top loader balance, which you'll notice only has a few decimal places. And then we have the analytical balance, which we have several of these in the lab. These are the most accurate of the balances. So notice they have the little glass doors on the side that you can open and close. These prevent air currents in the lab from affecting the mass that you're weighing. So notice how many zeros are present after the decimal here. 
So this, for example, is reading 200.0000 grams. So analytical balances are very, very accurate, but they're also very delicate. So it's very important that we always use a weigh boat or weigh paper with them. And if we're doing a measurement that it's not super important, that it's super accurate for, we can just use the top loader balance. And these come in even smaller versions that we'll use in the classroom quite a bit. The month and burner we'll use in lab several times. I think you all have a basic idea of what that is. There are three types of pipettes that we'll use. The, excuse me, the disposable pipette and the pasture pipette are just used to transfer liquid, so to get a small amount of liquid and add a few drops, and we can use these two. Then we have the micro pipettes, which are very, very accurate, and they can measure out certain amounts of liquid. So if we need to measure half a milliliter, for example, we can use a micro pipette, and we'll use that several times throughout the year. But if we just need to add a few drops of water, for example, and the true amount doesn't matter, we can use the little disposable pipette. Uh, you might call it an eyedropper as well. So parafilm is something that we'll use, or actually I'll use quite a bit. You probably won't use it. It's basically a flexible lid that we can put on beakers or any type of glassware. So you can touch it and play with it in class. It's stretchy, and we just stretch it over the top of a beaker to seal it off and keep air from getting in. So the last thing to talk about, you have your list, or you will have your list of lab safety rules. They're pretty common sense. This is one thing that's not on the lab safety rules, though. You'll always, anytime you have any kind of chemical, you'll have the material classification. It'll always be this little diamond. You'll have the four colors. The four colors always mean the same thing. There are different levels. So the blue square or diamond represents health hazards. So all the way up to a four, which we won't really deal with in this class, down to something like a zero, something like water would have a health hazard number of zero. So you should be aware, every compound does have a health hazard number associated with it. So even water, even though it's not hazardous, has a classification of zero. The red is the fire hazard. So again, four being the most prone to um, catching fire. Zero, something like water that really no matter what you do to it, no matter how hot you get it, it's not going to combust. Yellow, we have the reactivity. Something with a four will spontaneously react. Uh, with the oxygen in the air or the water vapor in the air. There's really not something we'll deal with in this class that makes it up to a four. But the higher the number, the more reactive it is, uh, the more unstable it is. Then the bottom section, the white section, you won't always see something here. Uh, this is kind of reserved for special situations. So the W with a line through it means it reacts with water to keep it away from water. If you see COR, it means it's corrosive. OXI means it's an oxidizer. So if you see a hazard symbol that does not have anything in the square, uh, that's perfectly normal. Most compounds don't unless they have some sort of special reactivity. So I realized that was a crash course in chemistry lab equipment. So hopefully uh, you'll be able to go back, look through the PowerPoint. The main thing you need to be able to do is recognize the names of the equipment and know the basic uses. As we go through the year and do labs or virtual labs or demonstrations, whatever we do, You'll learn how to use these and have a better idea of what's going on with them. But for now, you need to be able to, if I say get a test tube, know what a test tube looks like. Or if I say grab an Erlenmeyer flask, you need to know what that looks like. Or if I say measure out exactly 100 milliliters of water, you should know not to use a beaker. So really for the coming up quiz, all you need to know are the basic uses and equipment identification. And hopefully as we move throughout the year, you will gain a deeper understanding of how we use these pieces of equipment and what situations are appropriate to use them in.